Our Father and our God, we come to you with uh, hearts overflowing for your goodness and your bountiful dealings with us in this year past. And we confess, our Father, that as we look back over those days, there have been some hard times, difficult times. Times, our Father, in which we wondered just what was going to happen and how you were going to move and what we were going to experience. But Lord, you have proven over and over again as we walk with you day by day, your faithfulness. You are always there to undergird. You're always there to give direction. You're always there to comfort in time of need. You're always there with that word of wisdom when we need it. And many times we are we are dubious, we are doubtful, we are people who say, Lord, I, 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 I'm going to make this choice, I'm going to go this direction. And as we act, we act in the fullness of faith, asking for your direction. And if you desire a change to take place, you work that change for our good and for your glory. Thank you, Father, how you override the decisions that we make and the experiences uh, through which we pass and the challenges that come to us in the course of day-by-day living and seeking to honor you. Our Father and our God, we give you thanks for one another today. We thank you for this family of faith and we thank you for the in-depth growth that has taken place over this new year Uh, We thank you that you have been with us and you have given unto us with new folk who have come in uh, a love, and they have grown to recognize that love and family, love shed abroad in our hearts by your spirit, that we might be able to do what is humanly impossible to do as we become just uh, the vehicles, uh, the pipeline, uh, the means of conveyance, of your love to people who need your comfort and need that word in time of need and the help and the assistance that they crave. We pray, Father, that you would continue to guide us and to direct us, that we might be uh, humble and faithful and uh, dutifully given to your word day by day, for it is the word in us which works out in a marvelous way and builds in us the character of the Lord Jesus. And we thank you that that is possible. It's a growth process. It does not happen all at once, but it does happen as we faithfully take time in your presence. We thank you for the blessing of reading your word each day, of talking with you in prayer, and committing, our Father, the problems and difficulties that we face for your direction. And then how we rejoice that we can come together as a family out of our personal lives and be charged and encouraged and and built up in the faith as we share one with another and celebrate the victories and the triumphs that you give to us. Our Father, thank you for all that is on the horizon and as we face uh, a world that is so out of joint with you. Uh, in rebellion against you in many cases. Lord, how we pray that you would carry out your plan, which is the perfect plan, and it all ends with the coming of the Prince of Peace and the one who should rule and reign in a supreme fashion. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to know your will and to do it. We pray this for the leader of our nation, our Prime Minister, And we pray for those who labor with him, for those who are the premiers of our provinces and the mayors and the councillors of our cities and towns and villages right across Canada. And we ask that in these times when we are pushed beyond our ability to know right from wrong, to know what to do in times of crisis, that we may turn to you and we may cry out to you and learn that wisdom comes from the heaven for those who ask, those who seek, those who knock. We pray, our Father, that you would continue to undertake for the personal needs that we have this morning, battles that we're struggling with, 
decisions to make, issues to face, obstacles to deal with. Lord, you are sufficient for all these things. And we pray that as we are faithful in our love for you and love one for another, that you would cause us to grow and to become more like our precious Savior, that people may know that he is alive and he is alive in us and he is alive to come again in his own person to rule and to reign. Ready us, our Father, for that great day when the trump will sound, but keep us working as we wait and keep us fruitful as we labor in your vineyard for the glory of the Lord Jesus himself and your great person, our Father, as the Holy Spirit would enable us. Give unto us a spirit of joy in the process for Jesus' sake. Amen. If we uh, turn in our Bibles to the passage which we have uh, read together, we uh, think in terms of this new year and uh, the pressures and the stresses and the difficulties that come to us and uh, what we're going to do. Now, the world also faces these issues And uh, they deal with it in an entirely different way. They have different ways, of course, but one way is, well, listen, you've got to hang loose on these things. You know, you've got to be able to flex and you've got to be able to uh, change and uh, uh, spin on a dime kind of thing and uh, you don't want to make any commitments. So they have some things and uh, rather humorous and it's really a... uh, a humorous distraction more than anything else. But these are some pointers that we get from uh, the world as we face uh, a new year. Uh, Do you know that indecision is the key to flexibility? And we're all to be flexible. And we're all to be (laughs) able to do anything we want to do, but just don't make any hardcore decisions and you'll always be flexible, but you always won't get anywhere either. And then uh, you can't tell which way the train went by looking at the tracks, right? (laughs) And then there is absolutely no substitute for a genuine lack of preparation. And what's the alternative to that? (laughs) And then uh, all things being equal, big people use more soap. (laughs) which uh, which should be obvious but what does that have to do with it if you can smile when things go wrong you have someone in mind to blame (laughs) and then uh, we all hate uh, well not all of us but uh, there is a hatred for Mondays and do you realize that one seventh of your life is spent on Monday (laughs) <laughs> so don't waste it and don't blow it that's for sure and by the time you make ends meet they move the ends <laughs> isn't that right <laughs> yeah. so we, we're struggling with these things all the time and then things are more like they are today than they've ever been before <laughs> and friends may come and go but enemies accumulate Isn't that true? And then this is as bad as it can get, but don't bet on it. (laughs) Well, that's a kind of uh, distraction, and it is uh, not really addressing the issues, but it gives you something to think about in the meantime. But we all need help, and we all need direction when it comes to uh, God's plan for us to be his people accomplishing his purpose in his way. So as we look at this uh, passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, we come to uh, uh, certainly uh, some wonderful, wonderful counsel. And it comes with a crescendo of celebration of God's truth and accomplishment in chapter 15, which is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
First Corinthians 15 is one of the mountain peaks of truth and encouragement and help and hope for the child of God like no other passage in the word of God. Many, many mountain peaks, many, many uh, times of encouragement and display a truth and way for us to go. But this becomes one of the great end-alls and be-alls of our earthly life. And it ends, of course, with this great bit of comfort and this great bit of help and direction where we read in verse 57 of chapter 15, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a gift. We are faithful. He gives. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And in the summary of the truth and the backing and the fact, the inescapable eyewitness accounts of Jesus being alive after his death and after his burial for 40 days upon planet Earth issues into this great crescendo of praise and direction and uh, security and confidence as we live out the Christian life. Because as he speaks to us, he is really telling us that we are, what, in these two verses? And uh, you you mark it down very, very plainly. He sums it all up and he says, I want you, as you face the future, to be something for God. Be something for God. What does he tell us to be for God? He tells us, as my brethren, be steadfast unmovable. You are constantly in place with God. You are being where God wants you to be, doing what God has for you to accomplish in the way that he wants you to do it, and that is to be something for God in his place and doing his will. And then in the remaining of this summation here of the passage in 1 Corinthians 15, he continues and he says, not only do something for God, but also not only be something for God, but do something for God. And what are we to do for God? We are to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, always abounding, always involved in doing God's work in an overabundant fashion where there is never enough. We keep on keeping on and being a means, a pipeline, a blessing to people in the work of the Lord. And then he says, not only be something for God and do something for God, but know something from God. What are we to know? In this same 58th verse, For as much as ye know, what? That your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So there is our mandate of ministry for the coming year. And this is all based upon one of the greatest evidences of God and his power and his control and his timing and his visiting us and helping us in our greatest hour of need And that is manifest in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the certainty that just as we think in terms of uh, our dear sister who passed into the Lord's presence this morning, that as we leave this earth, we go immediately to be with him. That's the guarantee. He conquered death. Death is a defeated foe. He destroyed death for us. We have no fear of death. The best is only yet to come. And as we rejoice in that, and as we keep on serving God, so he says, now you can continue. And how are we to continue in this spirit with these guidelines and these directives? Well, he said, you know, we need to be givers. And we talked a little bit about this last Sunday. 
be a giver because of needs out there. People have needs and we have means to supply. But also give because it is a nice thing to do. Nice in the sense that it is a loving act. And when loving acts are done to people, they respond positively. It's unexpected. A goodness come out of nowhere when they expected the worst to happen. And as we give, we do the loving thing. In fact, he tells us that specifically in these uh, verses. In verse 13, or 14, let all things be done with charity or love. Everything that we do has the marks and has the packaging of love in it and around it and under it and above it, behind it and before. Love is our great contribution because it's the love of God shed abroad in our hearts that passes through the pipeline to the people who need it so desperately. So as we think in terms of this great section, we come to uh, what he uses as an illustration and as a, a point of contact with us as we live out our days. And certainly most apropos as we think of living out this year to come as God would give us time. And so what does he say in verse 15 of this chapter? I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, Stephanos, that it is the first fruits of Achaia. Now, Achaia was Greece, southern Greece, and of course, Corinth is a part of Greece. And these were the first souls coming to know the Lord Jesus as a result of the preaching of the gospel. This family, this group of people had came to Christ. And what did they do in response to receiving the gospel? Notice as that 15th verse concludes, they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. What a, what a timely wording and explanation of our response to knowing Christ, receiving salvation in him as a free gift because of what Christ did on our behalf, that we are able to move into our communities because we're addicted to this kind of service. Now notice, this was a choice that they made. They have addicted themselves. It wasn't something forced upon them. But they looked at life before, and they looked at life after they came to know Christ, and they realized, this is the greatest ministry that I could have. This is the greatest of lives that I could experience to be serviceable and useful for Almighty God because there is within me this compulsion to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. And I don't know how it is with you, but when I read these tragic, tragic stories of, of children that are abused, and I uh, think in terms of, of young girls that are being lied to and prepared for uh, a, a life of prostitution where the pimp gets the money and they do the work, all of this kind of thing. Uh, when I see all of this, uh, my heart just wells up within me and I say, if only those people had heard uh, the message of Jesus Christ, they would stay away from those people. They would stay out of those circles. They would not become enmeshed in this kind of thing. Now it is not always the fault uh, of the individual who becomes the uh, traffic uh, slave in the sex industry. But they play with these things and then become ensnared believe the lies that are told them, and so on. And we, if we only could reach them and say, the abundant life is found in Jesus, trust in him, follow his book, you will never be sorry. No one ever dies as a Christian and said, I am sorry that I ever trusted Christ as my Savior. I'm sorry I ever memorized scripture. I'm sorry I prayed. I'm sorry I ever went to church. Never. I rejoice in all those things because it has led me into this life that 
has proven not only successful for me, but through me to other people. And if I find a person in need, I will share that which they need the most, their need of the Savior, Jesus Christ. I am addicted. I am compelled to share of my own inner makeup and Christ in his spirit bearing witness with me. You need the Savior. Consider it. We cannot force you to make a decision, but we want you to think about it. This is your life lost and undone, and here is Christ who has made a provision free of charge for you to be forgiven, to be born into God's family, and to be a person who is used of him in a very profitable way in days to come. Now, very simply, as they made a decision and they hardly knew in their own spiritual life the fullness and the impact of all of this, they heard the gospel and it did so much for them, they got hooked with hospitality. They got tied in with giving and aiding and assisting other people and doing it in the name of Christ that they might believe in Jesus as Savior. They addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And really, it's what we do day by day that becomes habit, and habit becomes as we do it over and over again. And you've perhaps seen the illustration of just a little string and uh, two people uh, that are standing side by side, and you wrap it around once, this little string, and oh, you can break it all so easily, but you do it twice, and you do it three times, and finally it reaches a place where it's so strong that you cannot break it. You are addicted by your own choice, your own wrong decision, and you cannot help yourself, but there is a freedom that is found in Christ. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. And that is the message we have for any and every life. Now, that is our task. And uh, the, Satan has been very clever, and he has deceived us, and he sucks up our time, and he builds in all these other things. When do we have the greatest emphasis upon sport? It's on the weekend, which covers the Lord's Day. And I have no problem with sport in its right place as a participant or as supporting a team or whatever it may be. But when it becomes like it is on this weekend, you, th you look at the activity with regard to sports. There is hockey, the junior playoffs, and Canada now is out of it and is on their way home. And uh, that's a sad thing, but they will rebuild and they will get back. Uh, after winning uh, last time in their competition. Then we come to the uh, NHL, and we have uh, the, the Leafs on a win last night, which is great and tremendous. And then the other teams are playing, and you have your favorite team and so on. There is basketball. There is uh, the CFL, the uh, Canadian Football League. There is the NFL, the National Football League and the playoffs and the Super Bowl and all of these things are coming. The weekend is so packed with sport that there is nobody who can follow everything. It is too much. You can't keep up with sport. You're so engulfed in it. You become enslaved to it that you do not even think about, well, isn't this the Lord's Day? Isn't this a time when I need to hear from God concerning my own life, my own decisions? We live vicariously what these other people do on ice and on uh, the boards in basketball or on the playing field in football or whatever. We, we go through all of this and then at the weekend concludes what has been accomplished for us, for other people, for God. We have been an observer and we've watched other people. In fact, one of the worst things is, and uh, we have been among hundreds of thousands of people who have, sit, have, has, have sat in a seat watching other people exercise when we are the people who need the exercise far more than those who are playing. So we don't even get the benefit of the exercise. 
But here, God is saying, look, get your priorities straight and understand, you know, that you can be part of the family of God and you will have the joyous, happiest life because you're making that contribution as a giver. We are takers. We are constantly takers. But when we receive and need is met, we need to see that we become givers. So the task is laid before us. And we allow the world and the flesh and the devil to move in and rob our time. And another weekend is gone. And we are not in the Lord's house. And we don't hear his word. We do not fellowship with his people. And we are all alone. And uh, we, like the coal all by itself on the hearth, red hot for God, maybe originally. We give them the benefit of the doubt. But no fellowship, no input, no exercise of our, and it becomes white dead ash. And our spiritual life, and our every aspect of our life, our, our marital life, our family life, our economic life, our business life, our school life, everything suffers as a result. We fail and we contribute to the failure at large. So he says, check out the task and think about it you know it is a wonderful thing to make a choice to do what God moves inside you to do and to share the word of God with people all around us and we can do it in a loving way and you don't have to take a lot of time you do what you can do in the time you have but you reach in your pocket you pull out a track you say listen here's something that's been a blessing to a lot of people And uh, I hope this is a help to you. You Read it over. And if we can, I'd like to talk to you about it afterward. And so on. But we get the word out to people. And so as he unfolds the program here, he said, this is the great task that is before us. And uh, we are to be people who are choosing to do that which God puts inside this urging, this Longing to see people come to Christ before they mess up and destroy their lives completely. And then he goes on and he says, you know, to accomplish this, we don't do it all by ourselves. And Paul was a people person, wasn't he? The marvelous people person. He, all the way through his epistles, and especially in the book of Romans, when he closes the book, he goes on and on, and remember this one, and give my greetings here and there and so on. He traveled all over the Mediterranean world preaching the gospel and he hit people and he remembered them and he prayed for them and he contributed to them and so on. And here he does the same thing. And so he says, we do it where we are in the power that God gives us to function in this particular area of our impact. But we are not alone. We are not alone. We have all these other people and he remembers them. So going back to verse 10 in this chapter, what does he say? He said, now if Timotheus or Timothy come, and I love to have Timothy come. Who is Timothy? Timothy was his son in the faith. You remember that? When he was in a very desperate time of of ministry and his life was at stake, the Apostle Paul, and here he meets this mother and this grandmother and the son. What happened to the father? We do not know. He died or he, he left or skipped town or whatever. But anyway, Timothy was the boy and he was led to Christ and Christ began to work in his heart and he began to fellowship with the apostle Paul so that Paul became the spiritual father to Timothy and he became a preacher of the gospel. He was his son in the faith. And as you read the two letters that were written under inspiration to Timothy and to us all, he gives us the guidelines for godly living for anyone who wants to really grow and serve the Lord. He also gives us instruction concerning the church and its operation in those two letters. But all the way through, Timothy was not a perfect person. Timothy was a person who you would think, well, I don't know whether he has the strength to really succeed and to do all these things that are going to be asked of him. Uh, In fact, he has a tendency to be timid and rather fearful. And uh, he's hesitant 
but Paul was behind him. He said, look, God's called you, and God has gifted you. And so he says at the top of the list here, my team of people that are going to continue to minister here, I want Timothy. He's a good man. He's a good preacher. He's a faithful student of the word of God. He's a prayer warrior. He's a soul winner. And this is a man I want him to come and to share his gift with you. Go down in verse 12, and he talks about Apollos. And Apollos is an interesting fellow because as Apollos was quite a platform Man, he spoke as a polished orator. And he had it all over the Apostle Paul in delivery. He didn't have the background of theological study and backing that Paul had, but he did have the way to communicate the message. And he says in verse 12 here, as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you. See, it's not just one person. It's a team. We work together. And I say, well, why was uh, Paulus urged to come? In fact, many times he was sort of, uh, uh, well, his gift was different. So when he ministered, he he ministered in a different way than the Apostle Paul. Paul was a great uh, preacher. He was a great doctrinal teacher and so on. And he communicated as his books and his letters indicate. But this man uh, was certainly a a committed servant of God. And uh, I I find that, well, we we go back to chapter 1 in this book, and we find out maybe the reason why he wanted uh, Apollos to come and to visit with these people at Corinth. Because in chapter 1, and you look in verse 11 and 12, and what do we find? Uh, For it hath been declared. Now, this is why Paul was writing this letter to this church. They had problems and difficulties and so on. And so he says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that uh, there are contentions among you. You know, you're fighting, you're, you're, you know, you're arguing, you're, you're separated, you're disagreeing, you're not of one cohesive unit here serving the Lord. You're fractured, you're fractured as, uh, as a, uh, a church. Now, this I say that every one of you in verse 12, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. Oh, so what we have here are people who people were choosing and pitting against one another. I'm a follower of the Apostle Paul. No, I think Apollos is the man. He's the great preacher. He's the great orator. Or I of uh, Cephas, which was Peter, and, and then someone comes along and said, well, look, I think all of you are all wet and all wrong, and I follow Christ. I'm super spiritual. Well, these were servants of Christ. But the point being that there was a difference and people were following Paul's teaching or Paul's emphasis and Apollos' emphasis. And, and here the church was being, you know, scattered, broken, and not effective. So what does Paul say here? He said, you know, I'd like to have Paul, uh, Apollos come and minister to you. And if you ca- he came, you would read his heart and you would say, he's, he's not any different. In his message and in his purpose, he's different in gift and delivery and personality. That's all. And so I want you to count him in as one of the team members here. And so as he goes down through, he cites different individuals here he, he, that are part of the team. And we all play a part in the team. Some are, are less conspicuous than others, but all are to be serving the Lord and to be uh, rendered useful in his glad and glorious uh, service. And so we we go on and we come to, well, you go to uh, uh, Stephanus here that we have already talked about. Their house was addicted. They chose to make this addiction unto the Lord. And uh, what do we know? Well, they were the first fruits out of southern southern Greece in the... uh, campaigns that uh, Paul uh, supervised in preaching the gospel 
uh, to these people. And you remember those early believers, and they become the strength and the pillars of the work in days to come. And uh, their whole family were, uh, were used uh, to be a blessing not only to the unsaved as they communicated the gospel, but to other Christians. In fact, we find out that it was uh, Stephanus who, with these other people, delivered the, the hidden letter that we do not have in the Bible. Remember, the Corinthians said, we got problems, we don't know what to do, and we write this letter to you, Paul, and it's the response to that letter, which we don't have, that is found here in 1 Corinthians and chapter uh, uh, 15, uh, 16 here, where he is explaining that the communication came to me and then I, in turn, came with my letter with answers and help uh, for you. But the people who delivered the letter was this fellow, Stephanus, and some others, believers. And they refreshed me. They, they blessed me as a result of their coming. I was encouraged, you know. And uh, then he goes down in verse 17. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking in your part, they have supplied. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't minister in the same way. We are not God's answer to everybody. But we answer and we function some and help those who are involved here. And so he says, they functioned in their own giftedness and in their own assignment and were a great blessing as well. And God always has the team. He always brings the team together as we walk with him and are in fellowship with him and seek to do his will. And so it is that as he talks about our task as we face a new year, the greatest joy we can have is say, Lord, uh, lead me to somebody who needs you today. Help me to talk to somebody. You open the door. You arrange the uh, contact, uh, the circumstance, and God will do that. And we will be faithful in dropping a word here, giving a track there, uh, praying with someone who is going through a difficult time. And as a result, Christ is the answer and the one who is received as Savior. And then he comes down to uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla. And they move around. They were started out in Rome. They went to Ephesus. And there was a large church at Ephesus, which was the combination of the local churches. They got together. And uh, that would be as close to a mega church, I suppose, as you would find in the first century. But uh, these people... Uh, were faithful in their ministry. What did they do? They took their occupation with them. They uh, were tent makers like the Apostle Paul. Wherever they went, people needed tents. And uh, so they would make the tents and sell the tents. And uh, they were able to do this, had enough uh, finances to uh, purchase a home and so on. And what did they do? They turned their home into a church. And every home became a place where the word of God was shared, where it was taught, where prayer was offered, where people gathered. And they would say, well, this was the beginning, a home, a house. And then finally, where we get together, build a building, and it's the house and the home of God, a place for God's people and God's time and God's work to be done. So the task, the team, God's putting it together. He's using all kinds of people to accomplish his will. And then we find the triumph of it all. And the triumph is that we are faithful because we have the grace of God that is mentioned in verse uh, 23. Favor that we need, enablement, strength, insight, wisdom, ability to express and communicate, all of these things this is given unto us by the undeserved goodness, mercy of God himself. We do not deserve it, but God gives it to us uh, anyway. And uh, we are able to serve him with these things. So the Apostle Paul here is saying triumph 
is realized because we work together. And out of all the problems of this church, this church had a turnaround time, and they realized the very people that they were disagreeing with were really different aspects of the same thing. And by love and being in the right spirit with God in the right frame of mind and loving one another, all things to be done in love, as we find in verse 13, so we are able to get the job done. Different people, different circumstances, different personalities, but we all work together to fulfill God's great and glorious purpose. The triumph of it all, because one day we will give an account as to how we have loved and how we have served and how we have cooperated together that the word should be uh, preached and it should be declared. He concludes, and, uh, and this is where in verse 21, you can just see Paul. At this time, many people believe that Paul's eyesight was pretty well gone. He could see large print, but he couldn't see to read. And so he dictated his letters, which were taken down word by word as he spoke them. And Amanuensis, the individual was called, who did the copy for him. And then he would take, and this is what he says, and as he concluded the letter, he'd reach over and pull the quill out of the hand of the copier, the writer, and he would scrawl in big letters across the end of this manuscript, you know, his own word. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. And I want to remind you that if you find anybody out there who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not struck by his sacrifice, his agonizing price paid for our sin, then you write above him anathema. He comes as one judged of God, accursed, by taking God's precious, unspeakable gift and casting it away and destroying it and saying it is worthless to me. That person is to be rendered as accursed. And that was a sober word. We do not take lightly the gospel with which we have been entrusted, but we use it wisely and with love. And then he says, and I give you another word, which is really in the Aramaic, Maranatha, and Maranatha means, Lord, come back. Lord, come. Lord, come. You know, any opposition, people who are willfully trying to destroy your plan, your program, your church, let them be cursed. They come under your judgment. But anyone who looks forward to God's blessing, Lord, come back and be with us. The Lord is returning according to his promise. And with that, we take heart and we come to the Lord's table this morning, looking forward to the day when we won't need any more bread, no more fruit of the vine, no more symbols. But when we come to glory, we'll see him face to face. He is the bread of life. He is the one who shed his blood to bring about our eternal salvation and we see him as he is the only individual who will not have a perfect body. The scars are still in his hands and in his feet and in his side. The reminders are there for all eternity as to what he paid for our eternal salvation. Now in the light of the price that Jesus paid, are we willing to answer his call and to say, okay, Lord, in the few days, years, weeks, whatever we have down here, I'm going to be faithful. And I ask you to move through me as I sense the need to reach people who are on their way to hell and destruction and death and damnation. But I have the secret. I have the answer. I can keep them from going down that road. And I need to share. Whether they receive it or not, we do it in love. We let them know, and it's their decision from there. So may we ever be faithful. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you indeed for the marvel of knowing you as Savior. We never, our Father, would have designed 
a plan to deal with our own sin, our own transgression, our own uh, deception, our own ways of figuring how we can get by without doing what is required. Lord, how deceitful we are and is the human heart. But Lord, you're able to change the human heart. You're able to wash it clean. You're able to give us a brand new heart. And so we pray that as we face this year, you would move into our lives and give us a sense of love and concern. We want every person alive to hear of Jesus and his power to save. Use us to this end and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.